knowledge we're talking of anything. Even you go back 100 years ago, we're talking about quantum physics in physics or in chemistry or in biology. Day to day person had nothing to do with it. If you ask today, what is it that high end physics has to do with the man on the street? There was no answer. Today there is an answer. What is the answer to the question? What does high end physics have to do with the man on the street? It keeps him on the street. The GPS is what is important and the GPS works on Einstein's general theory of relativity. It works on atomic clocks. It works on sensors and so on. So this is what the change has happened. Earlier it wasn't so. When I was studying in MSc physics, the word laser, light amplification through stimulated emission of radiation, was probably known only to people who were doing MSc physics and quantum mechanics and so on. Now children play with laser toys, laser beams, laser guns and so on. Microwave, we used to look admiringly at a microwave lab in our university where only few people would go and say, oh, they have a clistron generator and they generate microwaves and so on. Now microwave is in every kitchen and so on. The chai wala, he either makes it on microwave or more importantly, he makes it on that induction cooker. The induction thing, only people who had done at BSc level physics, Lenz's law, eddy currents, etc. would understand what induction is, but the chai wala is using it. This is the change that has happened and that is why education is going through a big change. Education is no longer for the few, but for almost everybody. The way at which you need to know that may be different. So an ordinary person working in the kitchen may need to know what kind of utensils to use in a microwave, what kind to use in the induction cooker, what to use on a gas stove, and so on and so forth. They may not know other. Same thing, for example, we all use the internet. All of you use the internet. But if you went to the formal system and said, I want to know about internet, what will the system say? Take an engineering entrance exam, get to an engineering college, get to the scheme stream called computer science and engineering. In the third year, there will be a course on networking in which there will be something called TCP IP protocol, that is internet. Now obviously you don't want that. This is the change that has happened and that is why education is so important. And this is why the new opportunities in education are something which people have no idea, but are there for people to exploit. And my belief is educators are in a better position to understand that than those who are simply into investment banking, finance and so on and so forth. So anyway, without belaboring that, the urge is to encourage educators to come up with ideas. I'll take you through these slides. So one of the things, brutal truth, human teachers will be replaced by automation. The sooner you get to that reality, the better it is. So any teacher who thinks that this will continue is mistaken, just like I don't know how many of you know, but if you use the word computer today, do you think of a human or a machine? You think of a machine. But in the 1950s, the computer was a human being who worked with other human beings and whose name and job description was computers. And there's a very nice book called When Computers Were Human. This is written by a grandchild of somebody who worked as a human computer for so on. Similarly, in a few years from now, people like us will say, oh, we had a human teacher, we had a human teacher when we were in school. She taught us geometry, she taught us algebra, etc. In future, it is good. You already have seen Duolingo. So, in fact, I was in a session the other day, there was a French teacher. And she said, what will AI do for us? So first, it will take away your job because Duolingo has done that and so on. So this is another reason. So rather than lamenting, and again I'm saying, educators are in the most important and influential position to benefit from this opportunity. Jack Ma, who's a great entrepreneur, I don't want to go into it. He says he was successful because he was an English language teacher. Why I want to emphasize that is firstly, he's not a technology oriented person. He's an English language teacher. 
and very often people who are successful in business decry teachers they try to say businessmen are some geniuses who understand and teachers are you know miserable characters but he says i was successful because i was a english language teacher he says i knew nothing about business i knew nothing about finance i knew nothing about accounts but what did i know i knew how to identify talent spot talent and nurture talent and that is what i did my company is full of talented people they know business they know finance they know marketing they know this thing etc so this is a very very important thing that educators are in that kind of a position to do so next so i'll go through this very quickly uh, what is entrepreneurship attributes of entrepreneur etc etc basically uh, i'm sure some of the actual entrepreneurs are going to elaborate on that so i'll skip that next this is an important thing most important thing is an idea people will talk to you about money etc everything can follow it's a question of generating ideas and therefore you generate business ideas typical process is generate a lot of ideas and then you filter them this is very good but nobody will buy this this is fine but it's too costly this is thing very good but not allowed by law something else and so because there can be lots of great ideas which law doesn't allow you to do and so on and then you develop a business plan executing the business plan is even more important the co-founder the original team is very important very often you will see a startup begins with three people then they start having tensions all three think that they are the key ones finally two of them drop out and one is left holding the enterprise but then when he becomes successful he becomes very successful and everybody talks about him i want to spend some time on this many educational enterprises including people who made big money in fact when this baiju thing happened i heard the quotation of the he was himself a teacher he said i can raise so many million dollars in a week etc they forget that education is about learning and this thing they're talking it's about raising money so we'll go back to what education is and i have three phrases what is what could be what should be and this is where an entrepreneur thinks differently from others next this is a very interesting thing i have used very often this is the story of a frog in the amazon rainforest he is like any other frog except that by a genetic fluke what he sees is one second out of date with the real world so what happens whenever he sees an insect he pulls out his tongue next so when the frog sees a fly you know but due to his out of it information he misses and the result eventually weakened by a rarely satiated hunger the frog dies the others which use most research. the education so we still build education models on the past but that's not relevant for the future and this is one of the very important aspects to understand and why i'm talking about it because i ever so often <coughs> meet people who want to create a new school because schools are going obsolete new universities universities are over you're not going to talk about universities you know you will have individuals who will be very important they don't need a 100 acre campus their knowledge spreads through the internet and various methods to everybody and they would be known and you have seen so many people after the mooks etc millions of people are taking gilbert strang's course who knows which university is teaching in so the point is that institutional mechanisms which were the middlemen between the teacher and the learner will all disappear so there will be extremely learned people there will be people who want to learn and technology will provide the connection and there may be frameworks of various kinds which will help doing them but the, so this is what is very important that you anticipate what the future is about and i don't want to jump the thing but uh, many of you are aware that education in the metaverse is going to be a big thing and you know that learning doesn't happen in the campus learning happens in the hippocampus 
So this is another very important aspect that may, I meet ever so often people who want to set up a new university, new campus, this, that, and the whole idea is, but why? You're today going to talk about, and we'll have a session one day by Ramesh uh, Sharma. He will say, what all this? I'll just put a chip in your brain, and that's the end of the story. The chip will be updated with whatever has to be taught, and so on. And because he's Sharma, I'm Sharma, he's Sharma, we'll put together a ceremony called Brain Implanting, Chip Implanting Ceremony. We will say a few mantras, now graha ka puja, this, that, then our doctor will come and implant the chair. That's it. And as you grow, whatever you need. Since Vandana seems to like stories that I tell, I am forced to tell another story. You heard the story of Kalna. So Kalna was denied education by, Duryod uh, by Dronacharya, like Eklavya was. But unlike Eklavya, who said that it must be part of the minute? Ha, but I'm time like a this one minute. So, the so Eklavya, of course, just went to drill practice like the open university and tried to learn. But Kalna was different. Kalna said, Who was Dronachar's teacher? So, I will go to Dronachar's teacher. It's like if you don't get into IIT, go to MIT. So, he went to, <laughs> he went to Parshuram and got his luck. But Parshuram one day discovered that he has got admission by deceit. So Parshuram cursed him that whatever you've learned or whatever I taught, whenever you want to use it, you will forget it. But Kalna was a very, very, what should one say, very kind soul. He was a giver. And so much so that when his Kavach Kundal, which made him invincible, was asked for by somebody, and he knew this would happen, he said, no, go ahead and give it. So Kalna, instead of taking his revenge on Parshuram by asking his father, the sun god, to do something bad for him, went the other way around. He said, my teacher cursed that I will forget whatever I need to know when I need to know. Can you bless mankind with something where they will get to know anything they need to know when they need to know. And God gave the internet and the verb <laughs> and the thing. And so, <coughs> so this is current gift to us that we have this thing that we can get anything. Next. So Anthony says, see this is 2017. Anthony Selden has a book called The Fourth Education Revolution. I urge all of you to read it because he, he was vice chancellor of Wokingham University. He was also the head of a school. And he has said that in this fourth education revolution driven by AI, educators must play a major role. And next. And he made a statement on 12th September 2017. Robots will replace teachers in the classroom within the next 10 years, according to Sir Anthony Selden. So then, and we are already five years down the line. So only five more years. Of course, it won't be a, in one instant. It will take a few years. But there is absolutely no this thing. And we can, can go. Next. So learning, I'm a great fan of learning with mobile. The first you learn to use the mobile, then you use the mobile to learn. <laughs> this is our traditional thing. How do we learn? We often think that we learn only from the teacher and certificate and whatever, but actually in the tradition they talk about the four limbs of an animal, or four limbs of anything. So it doesn't mean, the English translation says one-fourth, one-fourth, that is not right, because all limbs need not be equal. In fact, in many animals you'll see their four limbs and hind limbs are different, but basically one part from the teacher, one part from self, one part from the peer group, and one part over time. Very often, what we learnt in school, college, university, we really appreciate only later on in life. And this is where the new model. So therefore, it is quite possible that you may have ideas of it. Next. So these are some of these people. This, those who are interested in the presentation, I can give the presentation. Let me quickly move on to the second one, about a few actual ideas. So this is some things from where to derive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'll share with you some ideas just to trigger. It's not that they are great ideas necessarily or whatever, 
but just to tell you that the ideas are abounding. Now, for example, uh, we have this new education policy or national education policy or whatever, which has been talked about for years. Millions of rupees have been spent on it. And uh, I almost said that we should have a seminar on tearing down that new education policy, but nobody is willing to do that. But uh, so what we will do is we'll just ignore that and talk about many other things. This is very important. You remember Anthony Selden, a professor and a school principal said that robots, but he's saying something else. And this is the inspiration to you. He says by 2030, therefore timing is more or less similar. He had said 2017, 10 years. He said the largest company will be an education company on the internet. Of we have not heard. So he's not saying that Google will become or Microsoft will become. Or the, this is why there is a great opportunity for fresh ideas. So you don't have to assume that Google or Facebook or Microsoft or Apple is going to become that. A brand new thing, those who will think afresh and be able to do that will this thing. And I pray. This is what Anthony Selden said. Next. So this, so now teachers have two options. Either you become more like doctors, researchers, and so on, so you advise people on what to do, or you become educational entrepreneurs. Next. 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 I've already said about Jack Ma. Next. This is a very interesting thing. So I like to mix up these kind of things. So Bhagavad Gita. See, normally we see Bhagavad Gita as only relating to death, etc. Because we read only chapter 2, chapter 4, etc. If you read it to the end, chapter 18 is all about success. So Arjun asks, what does it take to succeed? And I think they've deliberately kept this at the end, that those who have the patience. To th and he tells us, there are, you have to look at the Shetra, the this thing, and various techniques. So Vivit Cheshta, that is most important. This is the most important, that you have to keep on trying many things. Finally, he says divine grace. What we mean by divine grace is it should make sense. Next. Chris Anderson is a very important thing to remember. In, typically, in the material space business, the physical constraints are very important. They say, where are the resources? What are this thing? Who will do this, etc., etc.? And therefore, shelf space or product space was very limited. Chris Anderson said that in the digital world, that is no longer true. In the digital world, even if you have a niche following, you can have an opportunity because it doesn't take very much more to establish your presence. So when we're talking of all these ideas, if your idea is catering to only a very specialized group of people, that also you can get for the whole world to do it and make interesting things. Next. Next. So I'll start now listing some of them and then we'll have a coffee break. And then we'll get on with other things. First is mobile apps for learning. You know, there are millions of mobile apps available, but there is nobody who will actually deploy them, use them, or so on. And I have not read it very thoroughly because I don't have great regard for it. But does the NEP say anything about mobile apps for learning? I doubt. It says. Yeah, yeah. But does it, so is this a preaching or does it, because it's, a, okay, anyway, so whatever. So mobile apps for learning, if NEP also says, I'm very happy because I can say NEP also says mobile apps. There are, for everything, there's an app. And therefore, it doesn't say because it still talks about teacher training, etc., etc. So teacher training are not needed once children can learn directly from apps. And there are apps for math, there are apps for English, there are apps for writing, there are apps for improving your writing, and so on and so forth. So that is going to be a way. So one opportunity is simply telling people what apps to use to do. So suppose my English writing is not good, he will tell you use Grammarly, use this, use that, etc., and improve your writing. The other is an educational app store. So I, what has happened is in this uh, app stores, 
there is no critical evaluation of what app is what for. So I once bought an app about integrals and I thought it would be app to teach integral. It was just a compilation of all the integrals. So there was nothing, it was like a handbook, compilation of various integral forms. It did not teach you anything about integrating. So there is a scope for creating things which will tell people what they are. Next. Communities of independent educators. So I am a great believer in that. You see the problem is, if you have done your law degree etc etc, you can become a lawyer, register with the bar council, you could be a private lawyer, a government lawyer, a corporate lawyer, whatever. With a doctor you do your medicine etc, you can have your clinic, you can be in a corporate hospital, you can be in a government hospital, you can be in this thing. Same thing with your interior decorator, designer etc. Only as an educator, unless somebody opens up a recognized school, college or university, your teaching is not recognized. It is all then private tuition. Why shouldn't that be allowed that you teach and you take that exam of the university, whatever it is? And this is so interesting. Even the present dispensation talks so much about Gurukul, this, that, whatever, and our traditions in education. But even today, we don't recognize a guru as an independent educator. So the point that I am saying is that it is an interesting opportunity to create such a thing, create a forum or whatever, whatever, and which for recognition. So I am a physics teacher. I teach physics. You can take the exam, whatever you want. But my teaching itself should be, in some sense, recognized. Teacherless learning environments. Teacherless learning environment is the new thing. That if you remember, uh, Thomas Frey also said that, that teachers won't be there or whatever. Now, if you have a doubt about teacherless learning environments, in the field of computer itself, you heard of Code Academy? And there's a very interesting one called Ecole 42. Ecole 42 began in France. It is now in Silicon Valley everywhere. But you just have a huge number of computers. So you have social networking, you meet other people, you use those computers. Computers have all kinds of projects. All you do is project, there's no teacher ever. And they've had their first batches coming out, which has been well accepted, got well, good jobs, etc. And now it is being done in various other things. So you may find that in due course, you will have, some regulators may not have it everywhere, but it will become a very important. So Teacherless learning environment is going to be an important thing. Next. This I've already elaborated. Next. Same thing, subject-based independent experts, smart educators. Next. Yeah, assessment of learning. Next slide, dikha hai kya hai? Ha. A typical scorecard, report card that you get is like this. This is a board for a town in Texas called Alpine, Texas. It says established 1883, elevation 4500, population 5666, zip code 7983, total 91899. This is what your report card looks like. Physics so much, chemistry so much, math so much, Hindi so much, English so much, total. Uh, you are laughing at this, that is equally laughable. What is the meaning of a total of marks in physics, chemistry, English, Hindi? What does it convey? Even physics, chemistry, maths, adding them up doesn't convey. They are like three different dimensions. And when you get to, to IIT, they will first teach you dimensions and vectors and so on. But in your report card, it is not a vector, it is a scalar. You have added up things which have nothing to do with each other. Performance physics has nothing to do with performance in chemistry, has nothing to do with performance in mathematics. Broadly, we miss it all coming out of human intelligence, but in that sense. So, this is where, what, can back, previous slide. So, educational diagnostics is going to, so my, one of my visions for future education is, so, Sharma ji, okay, we are going to study. There is someone here who has seen that when you go to the doctor, the doctor used to make a drink, a mixture, a mixture, very good. So, you see that is the kind of thing, very clear drink, peely drink, it was a label, it was all that. Now, does anyone do that, doctor? 
सो 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 सेम थिंग विद द टीचर अभी हम कंटेंट बनाते हैं बोर्ड में दिखाते हैं ये करते हैं दे विल बी कंटेंट क्रिएटिंग कंपनीज विल जस्ट टेल यू ये कर लो उसमें लड़ाई होगी पैरासीटामॉल को डोलो 650 कर देने के लिए लड़ाई होगी कि वो बट टीचर्स विल नॉट बी मेकिंग कंटेंट अगेन एंड अगेन वी वर वी कीप ऑन राइटिंग द सेम थिंग अगेन व्हाई आर वी राइटिंग इट इज रिटर्न हंड्रेड एंड टेन टाइम्स इट इज अवेलेबल इन नाइस वीडियोज इट इज अवेलेबल इन एनिमेशन इट इज अवेलेबल इन सो मेनी थिंग सो यू विल हैव पीपल वॉट इज द डॉक्टर डू टूडे listens to you of course collects money on the side but listens to you recommends you a series of medicines and a series of tests and said come back again to me with your test reports and then depending upon your test reports he prescribes some variations on that and so on so this is what will happen you say i want to learn something so he'll say okay take this content from this 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 carrier me this 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 and then he'll give you diagnostics now we are used to the traditional exam but they are of no use what we need is diagnostic and it already exists in a thing like english in english for example toefl has nothing to do with subject matter it's your fluency in english i e l t s so for everything there will be a level so mathematics what level you are on not what is the syllabus that you did class 8 exam and then depending upon how you were with that content you probably advise you see you, that content you found it difficult go and do this content by dr rc sharma you will understand it better or this content by sonam bansal you will understand it better and so on so the educator's role will be suggesting to you content diagnostics and recommending what you should be doing if the desired goal has not been achieved but not that is i remember when i started my teaching the first thing that i was taught was learn to draw a circle which looks like a circle doesn't start looking like an ellipse speak loudly enough so that people at the last row can say, and when you write write in very large letters so that people can see at the back what has that got to do with teaching so point is today you have very good presentations etc etc you are talking about efficacy of learning doing thing that happen and these tools are now going to be based on ai based assessment and this is again the opportunity for creating assessment tools also of just recommending assessment tools see if you look at a doctor the best doctor has not made any of the medicines he has prescribed he has not read any of the tests that he has prescribed he has given you the sequence of medicines and tests to get you onto the path of wellness recovery good health whatever next next so this is a bit of detail the one very important thing is going to be chatbots for learning you see chatbots already you have siri you have alexa you have this thing you can imagine one of the simplest things every chapter of every subject of academic thing can be made into a chatbot so if you are a teacher of that subject you know that chapter create a chatbot for that and maybe you give it your voice so the person has a feeling that he or she is learning from you if they are uh, sort of you know involved with you and they like you it can be in that sense this is another great opportunity for educators see if you are <coughs> teaching in <coughs> institution there are only 20 30 40 students that you are teaching but with chatbot you could be reaching out to anybody and you could because you are an educator you can create a chatbot with the nuances where the typical chatbot you ask questions they give answers but as a teacher you will create a chatbot where you will also ask questions so you said something is given something and then you will pose a question to see whether it is really understood because just answering his question is one thing which was like a database search but as an educator you will also pose teasers so how will you do this now and then the student will be able to think so there is a huge amount of potential that is going to come up next general intelligence which is uh, something like the star wars you must have seen that robot 
all actual things. Oh. And then the super intelligence, uh, which is uh, you know excelling human intelligence. And you must have heard very recently that Google has come up with its most advanced conversational agent. They don't call it as chatbot. Lambda, L A M D A. Yeah. That is one of the most powerful. And they have fired one of uh, its employee also because the employee wanted to talk to the conversation agent. And during the talk, the, he says that the machine admits that the machine is sentient. Means the machine has feelings. Expressions the machine could exhibit anger at present so far. So this uh, uh, application it says that it is learning on its own. Alexa, Siri, these things they are there where we have added questions, we have added answers, and it goes by that. But the super form, the most more advanced forms are there where. We have provided some inputs, but then the machine is learning through whatever is existing and learning from there. That has gone very much. And very recently, there are certain other tools which are emerging, like uh, we can create videos through text. Last time when we were there, Dali. we showed that uh, we can create images through text. But that has we, it has been showed that even AI is biased on few things. So that, and how can that biasness come? Because these things, they are evolving uh, to their own self -learning. So machine learning through machine learning. Initially, and that's why the field of coding is also being changed. Yes, the, 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 the way we do the coding now is not the same as was when Sir used to go to Crunchback and now and what is in the next few years. So this is uh, quite uh, interesting as well as some people they are saying that is dangerous also. The way if, if, if machines they are putting biasness into the system then things will be little different. Oh, okay. Then. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh Sharma for your interjection. Another idea is the universal education desk. Now, you know, if you have a question about education, you don't know whom to ask. If you have a question about health, you know go to a doctor. General doctor, family physician, etc., etc., he'll take it. And if something is needed, he'll take you to a specialist. But for education, you don't know. There are so-called educational consultants who will get you admission into this thing, but educational matters. My child is not learning the way he or she should and has having some difficulty what should I do? Nobody. So an educational help desk could be a very interesting idea. Next. Now, AI is about predictions. So you could create something that, given the data of that person, and like what Dr. Ramesh Sharma said, given the data of the person, given the scenario, you could create a crystal ball. The crystal ball is a notional thing that you could look into the future when you looked into that. And uh, it is a very interesting, vivid way of explaining people rather than putting it on data. There was a very interesting movie again. Have any of you heard of that movie called Teen Deviya? Teen Deviya to Usma, Teen Deviya mein to Devanan ke crystal ball ke paas hi jata hai na? Ki agar nanda se shadi karunga to kya hoga? Karpana se shadi karunga to kya hoga? Simmi se shadi karunga to kya hoga? That is what AI will tell you. Agar tum ye padhoge, ye karoge to kya hoga? Ye karoge, ye kya? And it can be made into a very nice three-dimensional VR kind of a thing as to what your life would be. Next. Personalization of learning. Now, this is the most, see the most important thing which is going to transform this and is talking about everything is so far, we have mass amount of love. Whatever we do, we teach to everybody. So when Ashok Kamal is studying in IIT first year, all 150 people are being taught the same thing. But the fact of the matter is that no two people are alike. And the big thing that people are accepting as thing is the personalization of learning. So Clayton Christensen, who is a professor of disruptive innovation at Harvard, he was asked, you've talked of disruption everywhere. What about disruption in education? 
he has said he has a book called Disrupting Class. And the essence of that book is the disruption is not the use of technology, but the personalization of the learning experience. Benjamin Bloom, who is well known as an educationist, has a paper in 1984 called The Two Sigma Problem, where he says that the best education is when it is one-on-one, -on -one, etc. Can we have a mass education which is as good as one-on-one? -on -one? And this is the promise of personalization of learning. I've given a kind of a diagrammatic thing, various kind of thing. Basically, AI will pick up what works best for you, rather than See, what happened in psychology, etc., very quickly they moved on into statistical things. Eight out of ten people like this, seven out of ten. But that other thing was not there. So this is what it is all about. So I'm sharing with you some of these ideas. Next. And finally, of course, learning in the metaverse. This is the hottest kind of a topic. It will again be not the metaverse alone, but what experience you are creating, what pedagogy you are using, etc., that will really matter. Next few slides quickly. Next, next, just give. This is give you an idea. Next, next. <coughs> Here is a long tail of business ideas. I gave 10, 11 more. Give this thing, and I'm sure you will generate a lot more. One is a chain of educational malls. So there are all kinds of malls. Why not education malls? When you go there, because you like the idea of a mall, you want a cinema nearby, you want a food shop nearby, you want shopping nearby, and you'll spend some hours learning also there. A large integrated education city. So instead of a campus or university, the whole city, in fact, if you remember, there were times when some of these cities were seen as education cities. In fact, uh, Rurki, for example, at one time was just seen as an education city. Oxford, Cambridge were seen as education cities. So we can imagine well-designed. Nowadays we have well-designed cities. Chandigarh was a design city. We can have a design city. And in fact, UN has identified this as something called learning cities, etc., etc., and so on. Training a million technicians in the skills of tomorrow. So this will be very rapid, quick scaling. So uh, something close to her heart. She does a lot of things of rapid scaling, etc., etc. So you want, see, lots of demands come up, but are very short-lived. So you need a million people to do this. But two years later, probably you won't need that. You'll need a million people to do something else. So that is where this can be a very interesting thing. Center for Financial Literacy, It is quite interesting. People spend all their time making money. But once they have money, they have no idea what to do with the money. And uh, I was very fascinated with a book which I read, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which talked about this. But it is amazing. You see, in our education system, we have so many compulsory courses, foundation courses, this courses, that course. Nowhere do we teach money. We we'll teach physics, chemistry, maths, integral, cash, etc. But you are becoming a doctor, you are becoming a lawyer, you are becoming an engineer. And very few of them want to become sannyasis. Later on, that is more profitable. But, they, but, but you don't teach them about money. I mean, I just don't understand. And right in the first year, you should teach them which first thing should be how to finance your own education. That is the first thing you should learn. But it is really interesting. So there's a big opportunity for this kind. Then I thought of reality show on education. There are all kinds of reality shows which we waste our time. Why can't there be something which is educational in nature or talks about things which are useful. I mean, these are just some ideas. I'm not promoting, as I said. My point really is to throw up and trigger you to think of completely new ways of creating educational entrepreneurs. Next. So this is another very interesting. So you know all these major consulting, Deloitte, this, that, whatever. They're consulting firms. And I've been approached several times by some of them. They get something educational. They will come to you, say, I've got this thing. But this go for a complete, committed educational consulting firm. So Accenture, Deloitte, this, McKinsey. See, McKinsey gives advice to a lot of educational institutions. Why couldn't there be an educational consulting company? And I've mentioned it earlier also, but I'm uh, next generation learning spaces. So we. Most of US, including some of their presidents, etc., long time back, 
studied in what was called one room schoolhouse because were very sparsely populated so all young children were put in the same room and the teacher taught them according to what they needed the person new technology allows us to do that that go to the nearest thing whatever kind of people different subjects different stages you the human is needed for those human touch motivator supporter keeping this thing the content is all available from the machine and this might be another interesting opportunity a chain of centers where you go for the social interaction etc so we are seeing this either studying at school or at home no there can be a third place where you go and studying through your devices but somebody is putting that human touch social touch whatever is required and we used to have that kind of a thing next so this is equal 42 very well established now next school for lifelong learning so when i said that education is a big opportunity in fact this was said long ago by carl jung in his uh, book where is the school for the second half of life you are training people for the this thing they get back get into 25 30 by 40 they have another 40 years ahead of them where is the training for that and this is the new world it is not the same old world of the first 40 years and therefore there is a huge improvement need for school of second half of life or school for lifelong learning whatever you call it next so we'll stop at that have a break and after the break we'll have people who will contribute their stories their ideas and so on we'll begin with devyani and then whatever sequence we follows this thing right ha ha माइनॉरिटी second half of the day and uh, this is largely entrepreneurs who are going to talk about their journey and their ideas uh, we have ms devyani kapoor who is the first one she also has a presentation but many others including that young boy there says that they also want to so the, my suggestion is please give your name to dr ramesh sharma and he will then see that it is organized Sandana is there, Dolly is there, and uh, we will conclude with a short comment. So all others will be in between. Short comment will have the last word. And uh, anybody who wants to contribute, can please say that if they want to contribute. This session is largely for people who have been entrepreneurs. They are sharing their journey as entrepreneurs. It worked, for example. What was good, what was hard, what was I don't think any of them really will say that he regret he or she regrets having done that. But whatever was the learning, whatever the thing is shareable with others. Okay. So uh, I request you, whoever wants to do so, to share your name with uh, Dr. Ramesh Sharma. Short comment will be the last one.
It's all yours. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Is it on? Do I need another mic? Oh, okay. So, hi everyone. I'm Divyani Kapoor and uh, I have a company and uh, I wouldn't call it now and that gives me a great high. I wouldn't call it a startup anymore. The journey has been brief but it's been extremely experiential and uh, thank you so much Pansar. It all triggered from there. One day he tells me uh, Divyani I would like to hear your experiences as an uh, entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. Sir, please, I am. Please. So, uh, a lot, what has been put into this is uh, due to you, sir. Thank you so much because I was running so fast and I was all in that work that I didn't realize that, okay. And honestly speaking, it gives you a lot of high. Uh, it does help you understand when somebody asks you, you, you know, uh, you speak and you share your experiences uh, with everyone as an entrepreneur and I felt really, have I reached there that I can share because for me, answer asking me this was much, much bigger than I got a couple of awards last two three years and uh, honestly that did bring so much of high because I knew they were very structured awards, uh, iconic entrepreneur and all those things are very structured. We all know how we, I mean of course I never approached anyone but then people were approaching me that you must apply for these awards. So but when he said uh, it did help me internalize and I had put some thoughts together. One thing I would say that Anyone, believe you me, anyone can be an entrepreneur. First, I'll talk about entrepreneur. Uh, you really don't need that. I don't have. I am, I was and I always call myself an academician. I started my career as a teacher. And then it's been about 30 odd years. I've just rolled here and there in education itself authored a couple of books for Cambridge, was a principal, but I was very, I felt very arrested that this is not what I really wanted to do. And uh, so what was the most difficult thing for me and for anyone is to take that plunge and, uh, you know, set with a salary two and a half, uh, lacks and giving it up and taking that uh, step to be uh, an entrepreneur just because I did not feel like that I wanted to continue because I felt and when you feel that you have something to offer then you must listen to your internal voice and that's what number one I did. Now why we are talking today of educational entrepreneurs. That's very important when you're talking. See, the first thing, as Sir said, that lots of ethic companies, owners and founders are sadly not people from education background. Because we academicians never thought. We always thought that, no, we are very good in the classrooms. We are okay with being uh, in school, in the red brick walls and we don't think so, that's not. But this of course was also by, uh, I would say there is a role of destiny in this as well, why I did become, that is another story. May we just change the slide sir please? Yeah, uh, as I said the country needs more academicians to become uh, entrepreneurs for the simple reason that academicians know 
what are the nuances of the system, how the student would react, how, what would be the behavior of a teacher and uh, also there are two aspects to it. One is I was already having a better life which uh, was in terms of, thank you sir, uh, a better life in terms of external attributes. But if you're looking at internal attributes, a higher life, that is something which was the biggest motivator. So the best part is for to be a edupreneur is that it brings in a lot of deep-seated satisfaction. It satiates you internally because uh, you've seen it all. You're giving up your secured pay package and you're ready to take that plunge that uh, because you need to start afresh. Next slide, sir. Yeah, so when you talk about my journey from a teacher to a entrepreneur, and this is a picture of an award that I received, very important is that uh, when they say vision and mission, uh, if, let's not put these terms in jargons. Your mission and your vision is your calling. What is exactly, I knew I had to do something in education. I knew I couldn't, op I'm not uh, every, uh, I'm not intimidating any, uh, 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 what do you say, a profession or a, or a business. I'm just saying I would not have been successful had I opened a restaurant. I wouldn't have been successful if I op had opened a boutique. All I knew is I could understand the education system. Now the task was, I knew how the system works, but what do I sell? That was the big question. I mean, I reinvented, I had put, I still remember, I have that diary with me with the date uh, when I started in September 2018, writing, uh, collecting my thoughts. And I had put in a lot of things that, yes, I can do capacity building, I can uh, empower the students, I can do this. I cannot, but then once you are on that journey, <laughs> things start settling for yourself. You, you, the only thing you need to put in is, uh, you know, extreme, uh, as you say, conviction in terms of that I'm sure mujhe ye karna. Mirko education ko change karna. Your mission and vision, uh, mission and vision needs to be larger than your own basic needs. There has to be that internal push. That was, that was going to be very important. I still remember. Of course, my husband uh, is a realtor and I'm very proud of that. Things did get little easy for me. But sir, I was very surprised when he said, uh, when we bought, uh, bought this office, and he said, okay, though he's the biggest support whom I have today, he says, okay, if it doesn't go, then no I mean, this is, place is going to be a very good rental opportunity. And I was quiet, though I'm not a person who takes it. And I was quiet, I said, no, I'm not, I'm going to make it happen. So these were the funds and I did not take anything. Even before I was in the pro, uh, fully in the business, I had business. The only thing was I was only working. I was very clear on what I'm supposed to do. And uh, yes, all this while, what became my USPs? My, this is, I'm only sharing my, there are n number of, you can find so much of material, you can uh, Google so much, but at the end of the day, I'm just sharing what I was good at and what I, what it, uh, what turned uh, for my benefit. And uh, I only put it when Sir said that you put these words in it and I, I realized, okay, yes, okay, today, yes, 
Uh, in fact, the figures are less. We have a team of about 30 people, a cohort of academic, uh, academicians, about between 75 to 100, uh, you know, but industry experts. And um, yeah, we mainly outsource people because we feel, as Sir said, wo teacher se main nahi padhna chahunga. the world is open to the students. Similarly, find the best people. That is very important. Sir, if you could change the slide, please. Yeah, so yes. Uh, where we are today, so there are lots of people who might be struggling to reinvent themselves. That is just a process. Whenever you're planning to change, it is just a process to in reinvent. Your thoughts, your mission, your vision will be restructured a couple of times. But your core has to remain the same. Now, uh, where are we today and where do we want to reach? They are both simple. Yes, I want to create another Baijus. I want to become that cloud where I could have lots of hundreds of thousands of companies who can come and pitch their products on. That's a very fancy and a very lofty idea. Where I began, I had this vision. I was very clear, something to do with education. But how? How do you reach that? That's the most uh, challenging aspect. And things are never rosy. You get rejected 100 times. Even if you're an industry expert in terms of education, you realize, I know how the classroom or how the teacher or how the curriculum flows or behaves. But then some tech companies and all, they have their own uh, you know, calculations, gimmicks, how they. But then you learn. I started this at 50, and uh, in fact, 49. I'm 53 now. So I started it then. I'm sure each one, you're much younger than me. So, so that journey is very important and very crucial, as I always tell my team. And I, I honestly, I behave like uh, an educator, or I think USP. As a teacher, I never look at them as my employees. I always look at them my, as my students. So I always tell them that it was very easy. And it will be. But at the moment we are here, there slip slip chances here. And I will not let that happen. So I'm quite, you know, quite a mother when it comes to other things, but quite a father when it comes to, you know, certain non-negotiables. That's one thing which each one of us have, and we need to develop that as well. Next slide, sir. Yes, uh, these were my USPs, and sir, believe you me, I realized that when you said that, and I was discussing with my husband, he, I think he says, yeah, you're actually very good at it. So consistency was something, which uh, is that 100 times people keep rejecting you, you uh, but there'll be 101 time and they say that you know you only those people can crack a deal and succeed who approach the person seventh time so don't give up your deal can only be cracked seventh or eighth time we are expanding in South Asian market aggressively Sarika knows this every day there is no reply every day this but we know it's going to happen we are delivering quality. We are delivering something which takers, which people, uh, which the society needs. So there is no question that that will not happen. It's just a matter of time, strategy, etc. Then networking. Yes. Uh, this is when I say networking. Networking is not that, again, uh, you know, you go to 10 different places and you are only like hovering over. No. It is understanding, aligning listening and gradually so don't miss those opportunities which for example you're all doing it would have been very easy for each one of us not to come here on a sunday and during these festive seasons but each one of us who have come here means that we are willing to take that step we are willing to be uh, bring that change in our lives 
and of course in our business so networking is very important you need to have a very very good uh, you know thankfully i was fortunate somewhere because being an alumnus of st stephen's college i did have it little easy but no there are no free lunches nobody gives things to you free but yes networking is it then ready to collaborate you should be extremely open extremely open to and receptive that because tali hamesha do haath se bajti hai aap sochi ki it is your win win situation and you are going to uh, you know take it all no give bigger percentages to the other person so uh, when i have to close something and this is no no we are going to take that i said okay close it i am expanding more people are looking at it today that's what is important if you have that narrow mindset of no 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 i want an 80 i want a 70 you take a 10 me to ye no forget that be the larger one agar bada banna hai so you need to have those thoughts as well and last is yes this greatly helped me social media presence so i really have a team who dedicatedly works and i am personally involved i sit with them i look at the social media because it is going in public domain and whatever is put there it is it is an image that i carry in the market so social media presence is very much even if you're very busy spend time with your social media teams and a uh, pandemic did prove uh, a boon to me though i should not be saying something like this on a public domain but uh, on a different <coughs> connotation it made me actually get that kind of a visibility all that i could not have done uh, for say physical events because everyone was on a social media it did give me that footage and mileage and i used it uh, unknowingly but here i have put in a thought which i tell you that what is the percentage of i think vanna will be uh, because she's doing uh, on addiction to gadgets she's doing something on addiction to gadgets developing it. so uh, i'm sure how many hours the person is on the uh, on their gadgets or spends that time on that so make as much use of it next slide please yeah so okay uh, strategy team execution these are and i'm i'm not i'm not an i'm student i'm not done my um, management course or anything just a simple educator it was completely experiential way of learning बिल्कुल वैसे ही जैसे चाय वाला ने माइक्रोवेव और इंडक्शन और सोलर पैनल सीख लिया मैंने बिल्कुल वैसे ही सीखा मुझे नहीं पता था वायर फ्रेम क्या होता है मुझे नहीं पता था कुछ भी बट देन आई आई अटेंडेड आई लर्न इट ऑल द सो बहुत जरूरी है एग्जीक्यूशन टीम एंड स्ट्रैटेजी ना यहाँ अगर इनकी रेटिंग की जाए वाई आई से एग्जीक्यूशन टीम is most important because that is your inputs team aapki hai execution strategy hai. strategy aap kisi aur ki bhi use kar sakte ho main kisi bhi ek tech company ki i can use that strategy so of course you all heard of lou gertner who changed the face of ibm and he was uh, you know lambasted when he said that least ibm needed was a strategy he didn't mean he meant that कोई भी स्ट्रैटेजी आप कुछ भी उठाओगे आई एम श्योर यू आर नॉट गोइंग टू दे इन मेनी स्ट्रैटेजीज वट आई मीन टू से प्लानिंग इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट बट मोर देन दैट इज एक्शन एंड एग्जीक्यूशन एंड योर टीम यू मे नॉट बी अ गुड सोशल मीडिया पर्सन यू मे नॉट बी अ गुड यू नो प्रोजेक्ट कॉर्डिनेटर और यू मे नॉट बी अ गुड uh business development person but you should have that eye if you want to be an uh entrepreneur you need to have that eye that okay this person and even if it's a little steep and you think that person is good pick that person it will be difficult i know it's not always so easy but have an eye 
for creating a good and a powerful team and keeping your team very motivated is in your hands. Next slide, sir. Aha, one more, sir, please move back. That's one. Very important is, I um, entrepreneur. This, in fact, I researched and I said, yes, I'm exactly doing this because somebody who is in the company and who's taking those decisions. So he has, so they, an entrepreneur is very, very important. Somebody who has to be in between you and your team, you and your clients. He becomes an entrepreneur who brings in that kind of a value. And of course, as I always say, in, rely on your team's intelligence, judgment, and also their experiences. So many times, Sarika tells me, ma'am, you're wrong here. And I think, abhi aap chup rahiye, abhi aap rukiye. And it is big for her to say, but she can say all those things because she's empowered to say. So you need to empower them to make those decisions, but let them be accountable for that. Let them make 10 mistakes, but for each mistake, they have to be accountable for that mistake. So, uh, next slide, sir. Uh, yeah, there was, I just had put in that, again, it could be anything. Facebook, as they said, there were so many uh, such companies, social media companies, but why Facebook was Facebook, in which I think uh, because of its execution, because of it's trying to be different in the market, giving to the people things at lesser, uh, you know, lesser price or make things accessible to them, easy for them, those are very important. So at this time, when you're building your uh, company or you're trying visualizing it, see the bigger picture. Don't, don't please look after, of course, Every time you will begin something, funds will be meager. Kabhi bhi aise nahi hoga, aapke paas bahut saara funds hain, aur aap phir start kare, no. It will be, they will generate. That's not a big thing which I've now seen it. We didn't go for any market. Until date, my weakest team is the marketing team. But it's just that the work that we did is, we ensured that it's reaching out to the people. And that's it. And last slide. Yeah, this is a model. In fact, I was traveling with the. So, yeah, now I'm trying to tell you that we are collaborating with the UP government. Uh, Ganguly sir, Vineet Joshi sir, they are all part of it. And I didn't know anybody personally when I was a teacher or I was a principal. I didn't have any access. But by way of your work, things start. It's not that. Universe Alliance, of course, is does. But when you're treading that path, you're reaching that right destination. You'll start reaching the right people. So, what is saying is that when you have to say that 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 you so naturally, you will not go to Aishwarya Rai, you will only go to Ashok Ganguly. So, those areas will start. So, fact is very important. Any kind of fact. What is it that you're doing? Who are your competitors? Doing a competitor analysis. Even before you start, what they are doing? What are they doing? Why are they better with me? Sometimes LinkedIn becomes very depressing for me. Initially, I used to open LinkedIn every morning, but ab nahi karti because I used to start my day at a very sad note. So, yes, one more thing I must say, market is very dynamic. So, the moment you roll an idea, and if you're not prepared, there'll be 10 different uh, your competitors who's going to take your model. The other is, uh, at 40, 70, uh, this is Colin Powell's uh, A is ACT and here 4070 model is and which 
why I put it here is I have experience. So one project I launched and I felt it was designed, but it wasn't fully executable, like it wasn't prepared, uh, fully developed in terms of its execution, uh, the blueprint was there. And if you are 40% not prepared, then please don't go into the market. Less than uh, 40 or a little above, but if you're 70% prepared, or maybe 60 or 80, that depends upon your, this is Colin Powell's, you can have your own. If you are nearly 70% prepared and you're still not there in the market, then actually you wait too long. Contact, yes, it's all a game of contacts, not because they are killing it, but they do help. And how to tactfully use your contacts. Please don't go begging people. I've never done that. Never done that. Asking them for favors, asking them for... My very close friend is a minister in the UP government. I have seen Arun. I've never gone that way. So many times Harika also tells me, ma'am, hum baat karte men ka no. He will call me. I'm not going every, we exchange a lot, but I do not. So don't go. Let people come behind you with your good work. But you need to showcase your work. If you're not showcasing, then people are, don't know. And then the tact. So yeah, you need to be tactful. You're an entrepreneur. You can't have enemies in the industry. You need to, but put your foot down when you think that it's not happening. And yeah, this is, I just put it for you to kind of think about it, uh, which I've already narrated about Lou Gertzner, and I was very fascinated. For, for many years I've been reading about him and very fascinated with what he says that there can be many strategies, but uh, you need to develop on your action plan, your organization's culture. Even if you have four to five members, you need to work. And I think I'm done here, last. Yeah. Yeah, this has really happened that if you're doing good work, you are consistently rising. Your goal may be far, but yes, you're there in the market. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for kicking off so well and uh, having, I'm sure, uh, thoughts and ideas that are inspirational. Thank you, sir. It's in my nature to make things humorous. Getting ideas, etc., etc., so that you meet your obligation. So that's a very, very important difference. Yes, sir. So who's next now? I won't uh, miss uh, tell about her bio because uh, that is her story. But we feel very proud that she has. Is one of the pioneers. Uh, way back in 1999, when she launched the first online magazine, Indian Hospitality, and she has been associated with some of the very popular programs like uh, Manjine and Jamne. Uh, when Blue Darshan was very, very much popular, she has created many online courses. So, Thank you, sir. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so, thank you, uh, <coughs> Dr. Sharma, to really give uh, such a 
a beautiful introduction, but uh, <coughs> I really I don't know whether I deserve it uh, to <coughs> uh, do credit for it. I uh, I'm a knowledge entrepreneur. So in the education entrepreneurs, uh, one of the categories which is completely missed out is a knowledge entrepreneur. And what I do is to really create knowledge which will go across the entire uh, spectrum, educators as well as the <coughs> so both uh, the educators and uh, even the entire stakeholder community for what you are wanting to educate. So uh, the emphasis that I really uh, <coughs> Why I really worked on this is a very interesting story. I, uh, I just shared uh, <coughs> one of my very first incidents uh, uh, that I was given an opportunity uh, when I was just out of college to really design the first uh, digital uh, electronics lab. I'm an electronics and communication engineer and I had done my diploma and I was doing my degree. And in between, I had to really do this uh, uh, job so that I can really show it uh, as part of the <coughs> certification program. So uh, I got this opportunity and uh, so that was my first entrepreneurial opportunity that I took it up and I just did what I felt that should be done uh, because I was, I had learned electronics and I had the opportunity to design the first digital lab and <clears throat> later on I realized that this is what is entrepreneurship all about that you seize the opportunities whenever there is an opportunity grab it because opportunities are bought from behind. So you need to really grab that opportunity to make sure that you really <coughs> so this was a starting point and uh <coughs> so just in six seven months I did two projects that's all that I really worked in that first because I had to take a six months uh, uh, <coughs> job for uh, getting on to my section B exams. Uh, but that learning gave me a lot of encouragement that yes, I can become an entrepreneur or uh, that was the first time that I was introduced to that word entrepreneur. So that was behind my mind and I just got married after that and when I came to Delhi, I really started looking more about entrepreneurship and I uh, got an opportunity to really take up an entrepreneurship program <coughs> and uh, this was the first uh, entrepreneurship program by the DST. <coughs> so um, I became the poster girl for that particular uh, uh, project because there was no other woman who was there in that program. All, at the same time I already had a showcase with me. <coughs> so this was I wanted to really s uh, set up a uh, education uh <coughs> kids as a business. Now what I realized when I did the market survey that I am very poor at marketing. I have absolutely no idea how to market a product or how to really, uh, I have designed a lab because everything was kind of, uh, <coughs> so I, I knew that this is to be done, I did that. But I didn't have the, this thing where do I find customers, how do I really sell the product and so on and so forth. So I said marketing is my weak point. At the same time, I realized that electronics per se without software means nothing. So you need to really un learn software. I had no idea about software. So I consciously tried to really take up this thing that I take up a job which I learned computers. I am an electronics and communication engineer. So I had to undergo uh, learning on computers and what better than actually working in a computer company which is in the forefront of technology. So I happened to work for five years in that company and I exposed myself to as many number of varied kind of opportunities that came my way and learnt about them, uh, learned how to really solve the problem. What I realized in the whole uh, process is that if you take things project driven approach, that means you uh, try to find out a particular problem or if there is a challenge, spot them and try to really create a project around it and take it up from beginning to end. And the success should be measured under certain matrices. And in the case of uh, the company that I was working, the matrices were very well defined by the management. But 
when as an entrepreneur I think that's something that we really all need to know understand is that there is a very important element of <coughs> uh, metrics that you have to really define both for yourself as for uh, at the same time success of whatever you are doing. So you need to define that right in the beginning and that is what I have over the years done. So <coughs> after working for five years I said I have uh, gathered enough experience about software, I have experience about marketing now, but what do we do next? So I said there is another area that is a lacking area that how do we really try it out with somebody else rather than doing it myself. I am a very risk averse person and that is also something that one needs to understand that if you do not have the risk taking capability, uh, it is very difficult to be a, a normal business entrepreneur because uh, entrepreneurs by design have to take risk. So <coughs> I uh, went into a company which was uh, the uh, statement that was given to me was that you are going to manage this product and launch this product and this was an NRI <coughs> who uh, was in, uh, based in US uh, uh, of Indian origin and he said uh, Dolly, I want you to launch this product which we have developed, our team has developed to win an international award. So that was my metrics that was given to me from the day one that we have to launch this product and launch it to win the first product from India to win an uh, international award and that actually set my path. So I said, okay, how much time do I have? You can, you can launch it tomorrow, the product is ready. I said see product might be ready, I am not ready. <laughs> so you need to really prepare yourself if you really want to be an entrepreneur, even if it is an entrepreneur kind of a job, you need to really make sure that you prepare yourself to understand what are the kind of missing gaps in the industry, what is that that you can strategize to really be, make yourself uh, completely unique in that segment. So uh, your USP as madam also pointed out is uh, required to be understood very clearly that what is your unique selling proposition, but more than unique selling proposition what is the problem that you are trying to solve and who is it addressed to, how you are going to do it and at what cost or what time frame that you will be able to really do that. So, after a, a brief uh, uh, this thing I took up that challenge and uh, that is another pro, uh, thing that every entrepreneur should be a challenge seeker because you need to really look at things as challenges that you are trying to solve and always looking for opportunities which are not are being missed out by others or where you have your unique strengths to really attempt that. Sometimes you do not know it, others might be able to really point it out to you, but uh, in my case it was the second where somebody got a reference that I have done so and so, so and so work which is what is very relevant for product management. I had no idea what product management means, I had no idea how to launch a software and that too a software engineering tool was a very difficult uh, this thing, but I took up that challenge, went through uh, <coughs> various programs to understand uh, the basics of it uh <coughs> and uh, took about six months to do something which really positioned the company in a very unique preposition. Just to give you a little bit of uh, idea because here we are talking about entrepreneurship, education entrepreneurship. So, the so if anybody here is in from the software side, the software uh, development becomes more or less very, very uh, dependent on the developer who develops the software. Until and unless proper engineering methods are used it becomes very difficult after some after that developer leaves to maintain it. So it is very important to really have a structured method of really developing the software which is the tool that we developed 
and that too a methodology which actually allows you to develop business software. So, <coughs> so we I, I identified all these and helped to really put together that if this is a business tool uh, for business purposes, then we really work with businesses first to prove it. And then we worked with, I mean there was uh, certain projects that the company was doing with uh, various, so we got case studies written on it, uh, got a uh, lot of uh, reference material on the, this thing and also a self-learning tool which was, and these are the days I am talking about 92 where there was no graphical user interface. So it was very difficult to really uh, help people learn how to really write code in a proper this thing. So uh, MIT's open, way, open uh, courseware really helped me to understand some of the software engineering principles and also some other uh, material where I did self learning. And we are able to really uh, launch this product and uh, uh, very proud to say that in less than six months, I had the product positioned in everybody, all the major stakeholders mind. That is the most important thing that uh, when a startup or an entrepreneur which is launching something new, you have to capture the mind share of the people who are going to use it. So and <coughs> very strategically took up projects from consultants, from uh, <coughs> companies as big as General Motors. We had an application for them. We had an application for Elumax and all these were written as case studies. And these case studies were published in the best of the best magazines and textbooks of object oriented technology. <coughs> so uh, when the jury sat, they said this is one company that we have seen uh, article in PC World or DataQuest or XYZ and everybody in the this thing was familiar with that. Uh, uh, somehow they had read about it or they had seen the this thing. So this was not the days of uh, social media and this is how <coughs> one went about it. But uh, we won not one, pro, um, one award but two awards being the most innovative product as well as uh, most uh, innovative application developed on the, this thing. So <coughs> this was my first intrapreneurial uh, kind of activity. After, six, after uh, doing this project, my boss asked me what do you want, you, uh, I will promote you as a marketing manager. I went into a, a marketing management and I really set up the infrastructure how to really take that product to the next level. So I said we can't do anything until and unless uh, we do it in India first. So we are doing US but let us really kind of get that. So <coughs> uh, worked as a marketing manager to set up the channel network and this is another important thing that everybody needs to that you have to once you make a product or a service you need to find the distribution channel and work on the distribution channel to make sure that you can distribute the product and you are not completely dependent on the company who is manufacturing it. Because the company who is manufacturing it is probably good at manufacturing, not in distribution, not in support. So try to really build those systems in place so that there is a very <coughs> fast growth. And also uh, you can reach to larger geographies. <coughs> so this uh, about five years I spent in that and uh, I think we did exceedingly well. Uh, at the end of uh, almost four and a half years, my boss called me and said, you have done so exceedingly well, what is your personal ambition? So I said, I want to become an entrepreneur. <laughs> and he said, you are already working like an entrepreneur, so uh, we will give you an opportunity next six months, you do what you want to do within the company, use all the company's resources and uh, carry on with your project idea. And there is where my company got formed. And <coughs> My company started as a solo entrepreneur with the team that I was already working with uh, to implement some of the ideas that I had already done through the product, but I had a lot of learning. So we tried to apply it and the problem area that I identified was the <coughs> India is known to be uh, a, a land of rich diversity, but I was very, very uh, passionate about tourism and travel and uh, I said why do we have 
less than 2 percent of the market share of tourism in the world. Somebody has to do something about it. And the only thing that you know, international travelers when they come to India, they go to Delhi, Jaipur, Agra. These are the three major destinations, uh, Golden Triangle. And nobody really knew uh, Delhi, uh, I mean anything apart from that for India. So, <coughs> as an entrepreneur, I set up uh, as a consultant company, not as a full fledged uh, private limited company. And I said, let me try out my idea. <coughs> Started with something very simple, which was a first online magazine, 98, 99. Uh, I assembled the personal computer myself made sure that we have the necessary kind of this thing to really uh, launch this uh, service across 140 countries. That means, we were actually <coughs> deploying this uh, magazine on a uh, online mode and uh, if everybody, anybody is familiar at that, that point of time internet was very expensive, there is absolutely no method of uh, kind of reducing the uh, costs that were there in internet, very heavy cost, but uh, <coughs> I had this conviction that uh, we need to really promote unknown destinations of the country which are not very well. Uh, so, <coughs> started with uh, uh, I uh, found out that there is a tourism related uh, uh <coughs> program called Manjale Anjani which is happening on uh, Doordarshan, but when I saw the program I said it is such a a uh, horrible program <laughs> that if uh, anybody sees this, he is never going to be inspired to see India. So, I went into the, uh, the uh, producer's uh, office, took an appointment and I said, you have such a wonderful slot, such a wonderful idea, but such a poor execution and I had the guts to say that <laughs> despite being a <laughs> solo entrepreneur, sometimes it helps, sometimes it might backfire but I was not really concerned because I had a goal and a vision that I have to really bring tourism uh, India on the tourism map of the world. So, <coughs> worked on this uh, magazine parallel and I uh, told them that I will be your consultant. I just need uh, 5 minutes of content whatever program you are airing on Doodarshan, uh, Doodarshan which was a prime slot on Sunday. <coughs> Give me just 5 minutes of the clipping royalty free and the content that I can plus my tagline on the of my magazine on the this thing that this is uh, knowledge partner. So, <coughs> uh, that worked very well 20,000 emails every week <laughs> and uh, considering that uh, internet penetration was very poor email was the only uh, this thing and email how to really get that. So, that one tagline and my email id that used to flash at the end of the program. Once the program was very well uh, curated, it really had a lot of viewership. I <coughs> uh, so, this became uh, my first attempt parallelly Yahoo groups, all kinds of media that was available uh, <coughs> at that point of time I used to really and use my personal connects. And the other thing is the diaspora, Indian people living abroad, how do you connect with them? and how do you tell them to really get back to their roots. So, we did a program with UP government called Roots, which was basically to really uh, <coughs> have a UP, <coughs> have tourism in UP for the people who had, who were from UP origin. And likewise, we did it for others. And that is the time when I had an opportunity to meet Abhitabh Khan, who was doing the Kerala tourism. <coughs> Thank you. So, Kerala tourism, also use this approach for branding the this thing and that is what I was doing. So, Abtap Khan said that you have done a wonderful job as a source. So, <coughs> when I started doing that I found that this is going to be very challenging. How do you develop the course? How do you make the this thing? So, I said let me start with my own city. I come from Udaipur. I am married here, but uh, I am living here now, but uh, Udaipur was one uh, very passionate. So, I think that uh, it has to start from my city and I started doing that within the city bringing multiple stakeholders together, helping the travel guides to tourism operators to 
all the people who are there in the, this thing, preparing programs for them, working with them. And then in <coughs> 1999, which is just within a year of my uh, starting off, I did the first national level conference on tourism in Udaipur. So just <coughs> see that this thing that a startup entrepreneur and this is the power of collaboration. I used to be a member of CSI and I approached CSI that this is what I have an idea and this is a city which has so much of potential. Why don't we do a specialized program and probably CSI for the first time in the history of CSI there was a, <coughs> there was a national convention of tourism happening in a small city and that too on tourism. <coughs> so uh, and uh, I was able to really bring experts in travel and tourism from all over the country and uh, let people see what is the beauty of them. And during the process I also engaged with the Maharaja of Udaipur and got a opportunity to work with him to improve the marketing. So the, the whole concept what I am trying to say that is this approach is a knowledge driven approach where you really look at what are the gaps that are there, what is that that needs to be done to really make that sector per se really increase. So rather than really teaching somebody something or uh, educating people on hospitality or travel and tourism alone, I was actually uh, creating opportunities for others uh, by increasing their outreach as well as using technology to really enable that. So that was a good experience based on which Tradewing uh, actually approached me and Tradewing is one of the oldest travel company. I <coughs> started with them as a consultant to really promote their, uh, uh, their uh, own uh, <coughs> IT uh, related work but uh, ended up being the managing director of Tradewing Infotech again as an entrepreneur. I, uh, I thank them to really give me an opportunity to really reach out uh, an outreach of about 550 centers <coughs> that they had so that I could distribute my courses as well as distribute uh, the <coughs> travel related uh, programs that we were trying to do through their brand. <coughs> this work which was very fundamental in nature which actually I can take a lot of pride that today uh, we have more than 10 percent of the world tourism today and I wouldn't say that I am the only one who can take that credit Rajasthan tourism and uh, companies like uh, the ones that I worked with actually uh, helped me to really kind of achieve that vision and once I had uh, done this MasterCard gave me a special scholarship to do uh, MBA in tourism and then subsequently Nottingham University came forward to do give me an opportunity to do masters in tourism. So today I am a masters in tourism from Nottingham University <coughs> which is uh, rare for an engineer to really be but this is how entrepreneurship can be really developed and how we really go through the, this thing is a structured approach that I have created uh, over the learnings over the past uh, <coughs> these years which is called Smart Edge. So <coughs> Smart Edge is a platform that I have uh, conceptualized and I am working on it. Uh, the gap that I am trying to really address is that <coughs> there is a lot of gap between the industry and the academia and uh, <coughs> students are not prepared for the future, especially future of work, how work is going to be done in the future is going to be completely IT enabled and we are already seeing it especially in the travel tourism. So <coughs> looked at certain verticals and said this is an approach that we will try it out and work on this. So it is an integrated platform where learning, innovation and acceleration happens. Next slide. So <coughs> this is one of the uh, slides which is the inspiration behind this particular project that uh, there is a uh, most of the startups are measured by the, the current model of capitalism which has not really yielded the best of the interest because the shareholder uh, value is only taken into account not the stakeholder value that is created. 
So, this stakeholder capitalism is something that has been promoted while I was doing my program from uh, London School of Business. I uh, came across uh, this study and so the, the gap between the shareholder value and the stakeholder value can be closed by creating a value, uh, the value creation over a time. You won't see instant results, but you will see the result and <coughs> it took me 10 years to really show and prove that tourism can be improved from less than 2 percent to almost 10 percent down. Next slide. <coughs> so, uh, right now Smart Edge as a platform is working to prepare youth, women and entrepreneurs for managing the future of work in the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, I am thankful to Dr. Panth to really introduce me to the fourth industrial revolution, especially in education. I have been trying to really use the fourth industrial revolution in the industry, uh, uh, specifically to really sensitize the small and medium enterprises and the startups in this area. Next slide. <coughs> so, what are we trying to do? We are trying to convert the challenges to opportunities. So, there are multiple, yeah, multiple uh, challenges which need to be converted into opportunities, especially in terms of livelihood options, the right knowledge, right skills for both employment or entrepreneurship and also harnessing the untapped potential of youth, women and SMEs. Women in India specifically just about 35 percent of women are economically independent <coughs> and SMEs are the backbone of the industry, but they do not have enough automation. So, <coughs> SmartEdge as a platform is a technology enhanced innovation platform for supporting learning of skills and knowledge to build smart people, smart technology and smart business to manage the future of work. So, <coughs> what does SMART stand for? Yes, this is a, a methodology that I have uh, borrowed from Peter Drucker's book. Uh, it is a famous goal setting uh, methodology called SMART. S stands for specific, M for measurable, A for assignable, R for relevant and T for time bound. The whole idea is to really create a, a, an approach which basically has a very specific goal to achieve which is measurable and assignable to people what they have to do which is relevant to the current problem that you have in a time bound manner. And to do that, next please. What we did was to create a mindset of the <coughs> looking at the emerging opportunities and challenges and technical manpower skills and uh, knowledge gaps and bridging them through the industry and academia collaboration. Also creating capacity, capability and creativity of people in the whole. Why to do a collaborative uh, development of the world class products and services. Uh, the whole emphasis is on enhancing the employability and entrepreneurship. Next. Next. So, a busy slide, I will not go uh, much into details of it, but as a learning paradigm shift, this is uh, where we differ from the normal uh, learning methodologies is that we look at four aspects, the content, the collaboration, community and commerce. These four are fully integrated into the system and that is why the whole uh, uh, <coughs> result that you really get is a transformational uh, result and we go sector by sector. We go by a problem that is well defined and every project that we have done has actually used this approach that how do we connect it with the commerce, connect it with the community, connect it with uh, multiple stakeholders, collaborate together. Uh, with the right kind of context. <coughs> the left hand side of the slide is something very busy, it will take me a lot of time, I am skipping that, but if anybody wants to know I will <coughs> just to share. These are some of the uh, things that we have done in the past, uh, worked with the uh, SME CEO knowledge series. I identified that SMEs have a, a serious problem that after a certain growth they really become stagnant because they have not updated their skills. And this is the mindset that needs to be changed and that has to be done from the entrepreneur end. It is very difficult to really change the mindset of the 
entrepreneur because he's running a 200 crore company. He is not going to come to you for a training program. So we created this program with the help of ICIC Bank. This was an opportunity that I spotted that ICIC Bank was wanting to reach out the, to the SMEs and I created this program which was one of the most successful program in the informal learning method where <coughs> we actually helped uh, SME uh, entrepreneurs to really get on to the CEO mindset. And what are the things that need to be done? We created a handbook. And that handbook was launched by Dr. Kalam. And there's a series of uh, CDs and uh, programs that we done did across 20 countries on this. <coughs> so right now, we are working with a hackathon approach for working with uh, students, youth and women, especially on innovation and business challenges. And we facilitated almost 10,000 youth and women uh, in the new technologies using the experiential learning method. And also during the process accelerated 55 ideas to create value in terms of intellectual property, business and technology entrepreneurs. Yes. <coughs> so just to give some, uh, some of these which are there, SMS Gyan was the company that uh, I incubated when uh, the founder was in second year of college. Uh, today, uh, Twitter co-founder is on his board. And uh, <coughs> the first uh, DCB Bank Innovation Carnival, I was uh, this thing, MIT Kumbhathon at Nasik. Actually, we did, uh, we solved most of the problems of the Kumbh Mela. And uh, at Hack VSIT, WIPS in Delhi, we worked on the SDG goals and tried to really create solutions around the SDG goals. <coughs> So uh, these are some of the target areas, uh, not uh, really going to go about it. But the key technologies that we are currently working on is Web 3.0, AI, AR, VR, IoT, robotics, and blockchain. And let me tell you, I spent at least seven to eight hours learning myself on these because I am also very new to these areas. Next, please. So this is the most, and I'll close here, <coughs> is a uh, fashion tech area. And my interest in fashion actually came out with the, uh, during the pandemic because uh, during the pandemic, a uh, lot of artisans and weavers that I was uh, actually helping one of my startups to work with is uh, running an NGO called Ayan Khadi. I uh, came across that 55 lakh people's livelihood has come to a near stop during the pandemic. So <coughs> created this program, which was a boot camp, yeah, which was a boot camp and uh, for almost 200 participants, we had to close the 200 participants because I couldn't really handle more than that online. 15 days online hackathon, uh, online handloom festival with 500 exhibitors that we really took from these uh, far off places, uh, artisans and viewers, and B2B webinars for the entire economy. The whole thing was done completely online. We never met any of these people who really uh, came into the program. But just one post of mine uh, on the LinkedIn actually got two of the keynote speakers, one an AI expert in Netherlands and other the startup bootcamp managing director to come and participate in our program. So I'm just saying that the power of internet is humongous if you use it effectively and you create programs which actually create value for the economy as well as your stakeholders. So uh, this is the team. I won't go through this. I just I close here. <coughs> I'll just end by saying that it's uh, entrepreneurship, education, entrepreneurship needs to be looked at as a knowledge entrepreneurship rather than just education entrepreneurship. I personally believe in that because you have to really focus on one small area that you can bring about the necessary change that you want to really see yourself. And <coughs> work relentlessly to make sure that you achieve your targets. And I set up my goals for the five years, uh, this thing that this five year I'm going to do this in tourism, for next five years in the SME sector, now the next five years that I'm working is on the uh, youth and women. So with that, I'd like to end. And thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm very sorry that I've taken much more time.
but uh, 37 years of work <laughs> cannot be <laughs> shortened in this thing. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, for a very comprehensive story. Uh, Am I at the right position or do I need to <coughs> clear the background? Okay. Hello everyone. I feel so incredibly lucky. I am in the room full of people. On our one hand Professor Pant and on the other hand teenagers and everybody is so charged up with this entrepreneurial energy. I myself am one of them. So I will just share very quickly about few things that I uh, saw, I encountered during my entrepreneurship journey. My first very important project was when I was in 10th standard. My parents suddenly went through a financial crisis and my father kind of was trying to manage some money. It was a very small amount. It was just 8,000 rupees or something. But because at that time, it was very, very critically important. Everybody was running around, even my mother was trying to ask for help. So I asked my father, let me help you, you know, uh, come up with that money. And at that time, I used to give tuitions and my fees was 300 rupees or something. So my father said, oh, koi baat nahi, bacha hai. So usko man rakhne ke liye, he told me that, okay, fine, do whatever you can. So I went across, spoke to all the parents who I was giving tuitions to unke bachon ko. And I asked them to give me an advance of one year and I will give them three months free and they very happily agreed. I was a very hardworking person, I was very sincere. They knew that I will keep my word and uh, they gave me that chance. I came back home in two hours with 9,600 rupees and my father told me that day, you are my Olympics gold medal. So very important learning in very early age I got was that we all have resources around us. And whenever we need to tap into something, even if it's critically urgent, you can go there, you can find out those resources in your friend circle, in your family, in your mobile phone. The only thing that is asked of you as an entrepreneur is, what are you going to give in return? What value can you come up with? So that is something I always live by. Other very important thing is that I have always considered other people's money, OPM is a very important resource. Whenever I have to do a big project, my biggest project was a high-rise multi-story residential development project. And um, when I bought the land, that too, I gave only the token money of the land. And I knew I had to come up with crores and crores of money to make that, which I didn't have. So I went around talking to people to buy houses in the project that I wanted to develop. Again, going by the philosophy of raising other people's money from my, for your own business. And I sincerely believe that if your idea has any merit, it will be saleable. So if I go to people 
with my idea and they are not ready to give me money for it that means there is something that i still need to work on it's not ready to go out there so i worked on that project and i raised around 5 crores in 6 months that gave me a lot of validation and i went ahead with that project a lot of times i encounter with so many problems and i tell myself that business is all about solving a problem if i have something in front of me and if i can't dedicate my intelligence energy and resources to solve that then it will not be valuable for people to give money and when i was making this project my architect was really tired of designing the drawings redesigning them revising them and he told me why are you putting so much energy into it aap thodi rehne wale ho yahan pe and that resonated with me i thought what if i have to come and live here what will my experience be each and every house was designed i you know those drawings went for 80 revisions which is like <laughs> a lot of revisions but that sentence stayed with me what if i have to go and live there what if i have to sleep in that bedroom cook in that kitchen so all the houses were designed and redesigned keeping that in mind so another very important thing i live by as an entrepreneur is that i have to solve a problem which is important for people otherwise i will never make money um i have always lived very frugally throughout all of this because once i have money i make sure that i put it to right use i made some mistakes during my journey i was incredibly successful in this housing project i made a lot of money but see bahut important hai successful logon ke paas wo nahi hoti hai main unme se ek hu i am extremely in earning a lot of money so that mistake i will never do again um of course i will continue to live frugally and i will continue to uh, do my best in all the businesses that i am coming up with that will never change also a very important thing i did in all my businesses was to identify strengths of people when i was doing my housing project i identified that out of i had 78 people on the payroll and out of them around 17 18 people could easily be trained and upskilled so i did them. i did that i identified my contractors were giving me a lot of trouble so i trained a carpenter to become a leader and i told them that you know you are the right person your loyalties are the are at the right place why don't you take up this job so i will continue to do that in my future and there was also i will identify right kind of people it's very very important i have came across uh, i have come across several people who uh, were very very good for the company and some people who were absolutely not you know at the right place at the right time and uh, looking after people as much as it is important to look after your people it is equally important to eliminate the people who are not uh, giving growth and the right kind of direction to your vision to your project uh one of my biggest failures i want to tell you we all talk about following our passion so my passion is to identify a problem and solve that and i consider myself extremely good with a few things but i also make mistakes i also learn from them some of them are taking a big bite bigger bite than i can chew and i have learned over a period of time that i will pick up small batches of targets and i will stick to them i will give my energy and time to only uh, you know uh, projects which are sizable and which could which can be escalated you know further in the future um my biggest failures were not following my passion i recently took up a very very big project around 3 years ago i went into mining it was completely you know not my area of expertise i knew nothing about it but i told myself i have done so many successful businesses this also i will learn quickly and i will just you know become a master in it that was a very big mistake the project is still stand still so my important learning was as much as i have capabilities and faith in what i can do i should also know about what i can not do that equally is important so all the failures that i have had in my life especially in entrepreneurial journey were when i did not follow my instinct of not knowing where my weaknesses are of course i am confident about my strength but at the same time knowledge about weaknesses is very important i have another page full of things but i will probably get another opportunity to cover them in the future thank you so much thank you i think the most important thing she said is one thing i agree with her on the basis of what you should not do. that's a very very important thing we often forget this and uh, in nice choices it is very important and in most cases we don't get it done
pay you for. Now, if they're only going to follow passion, but nobody's going to pay you for it, it's no. And that is why that Ikigai idea I gave you, right? Because it builds all these things. Many people, they follow your passion. No, follow your passion, it is consequences is no use. Follow your passion, what people want, what you can do, etc., and what you can do with, and what people will pay you for. Pay you. Then you will be successful. Absolutely. So, next question. I want to share one last thing I forgot to mention. From last five years, I was solving a problem of identifying, I'm uh, educating youngsters to identify threats and vulnerabilities while they are navigating the world of internet. So I highlight a lot of pitfalls for them and now I'm slowly transitioning into helping them, um, you know, uh, learn about the um, consequences of misuse and overuse of devices. So I'm on that journey, but again, I'm following all the principles of you know whatever the failures and successes have taught me thank you thank you It's okay, it's okay. Yeah. Um, all right, greetings everyone. I know I have, we, I know we're all very exhausted right now. Everyone has spoken and um, I know I do not actually quote unquote deserve to stand here because like, you know, uh, there was Divyani ma'am, there was Dolly ma'am, Vandana ma'am, they're all so established and I'm what, I'm a, I'm a teenager right now. I am not even close to the status these guys have, right? I think I do have insights and I've seen the presentation by M.M. Pansar as well. Uh, there were a few things that he talked about and uh, one of them was specified learning, right? Everyone has a different way of learning. And I have a few thoughts about that. In fact, he mentioned one of the ways of learning, MBTI. It's a Myers-Briggs type indicator. It's a personality test, actually. And I've been, I've been researching for that for seven years now, actually. I, I started when I was 12. And, um, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I know it's, it's a drag, but I'll just do it right now. Um, okay, so I was 17 when my first startup started. Okay, so it was a person online. They had made a post about, hey, I want to do an animation or something. And I approached them and I told them, hey, I can get you. First, first of all, I do not know anything about, I did not know anything about animation. I did not have contact with any animators. I did not have contact with any voice actors or just about anyone. But I approached this person and I was like, hey, I can get you in touch with the voice actors. I can get you in touch with animators. I can get you in touch with everyone. Now, I'm a person who did not have any experience with any of this. And yet, I was making these claims because I knew that if I get the opportunity, I can do it. And after that, after I talked to that person, in the next six months or so, we collected over 200 people in our first animation studio. And today, I have an animation studio of my own. It has 200 people from all over the world. And um, our latest website visit got over 30 million views from all over the planet, actually. And that's just one of my startups, actually. And uh, I have this other startup of my own. It's called the Icarus Visuals. And we work on video animation, you know, copywriting, content writing, video engineering, and audio engineering, and all of that. This was about me, but what I really want to talk about, this the one small insight that I have compared to like the rest of you, I do not have as, as much insight on leadership or management. But one thing I've noticed about leadership is that you have to be there for your team when the rest of your team is demotivated as hell. Now what happened was I have a director in my animation studio and the director decided to one day just leave the project. They just left the project. The entire team was in chaos. Everyone was in chaos. Nobody knew what to do and how to do because the main person who was supposed to be the second in court and the person who was managing the whole episode left. Now I did not have any idea myself because I did not see this coming. Nobody saw this coming. So I, I called my team into a meeting and I was like, hey, listen, I've been thinking about this and I have a plan. I've been think, I have a plan for the last three months. I have two to three plans. So you guys, don't worry. I have everything under control. I did not have anything under control. But it's like you have to make your team believe that you have something. Because if they lose the morale, the team will fall down. The moment the team falls down, there's nothing. So I know the lying in itself is a very bad thing. I know it's like demoral. But like... Can once, if one small lie can change your team's perspective, if, if it can save your team, then is it really that harmful? I know it's a question that we can, you know, ponder ourselves and we can have a philosophical debate. 
I'm not going to go into all of that. This is just a one small insight that I had in leadership. And obviously, it's nothing compared to the rest of the people who have spoken here. But this is just one small thing that I had. And I just, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon. So uh, M.M. Pansar talked about Myers-Briggs type indicator. It's, an, um, it's a type indicator. So all of you, we are all distinct individuals, right? So you're all distinct individuals. All of you have different types of personalities. So Myers-Briggs basically says that there are 16 types of individuals in this world. And they're defined by four basic things. If you derive energy from being around people, then you're an extrovert. But if you derive energy from being alone, from spending time in solitude, you know, not solitude, spending time alone, then you're an introvert. That's the first division. The second is how you view the world. If you view the world with your observational skills, then you're a sensor. But if you view the world with the intuition skills, then you're an intuition. And you know, there are four categories which, you know, permutation, you need a total of 16 types. And each type has a different way of perceiving the world. For example, an ESFJ is very good at management, but at the same time, an INTP is very good at science. And you know, the moment you find out these small, small things, you can use that to actually see if the person would be capable for a lot of things. Now I know that the moment I say this, you cannot put a person into a distinction. But human beings, as individuals, we are very, very different. And we cannot just be put into 16 types. But it's a way of generalizing and overseeing the opinions of you know, the collective people around the world. I, I'm going to end this. Uh, Sir talked about Mahabharata. Actually, I'm very much into the Indian philosophies. I've been very much into philosophy, and I've read a um, few of the like few articles from the Vedas. I'm not very haven't read the, all of them, but there was this one thing you were talking about how the internet is going to change everything, right? Uh, do you remember this one instant in Mahabharata when um, Arjun, when basically Arjun, uh, I wanted to seek uh, ask Krishna, hey, what exactly are you, right? Yeah, and then. Yeah, Vishu, and uh, Krishna was like, I have to give you this eyes to see me. Because your eyes, exactly, the, uh, your eyes are not powerful enough to actually see the real me. What I genuinely believe, that the internet today, the world that we are going towards, are that eyes that we're going to be giving by the God. And I think that's a very great perspective to have in this, especially in this day and age. So yeah. I am really thankful you guys gave me the opportunity to talk. Uh, I would love to connect with all of you. And I'm really sorry if this was longer than I expected it to be. <laughs> Thank you. I'm 19, actually.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rajni Jilka. Uh, thank you for Ashok ji for uh, calling me. He is my mentor, and thank you for meeting Ramesh sir, uh, Sharma ji, Pan sir. I think destiny is bringing lot of stuff together. To begin with, uh, I heard lot of thoughts, and I see so common thought process under the same umbrella. I'll just take two minutes. Uh, I am an educationist. Uh, by choice, uh, I took a conscious decision of getting into education sector 18 years before. Though I cleared the SSP Air Force, coming from a defence family, uh, youth is very close to my heart. They are like my heartbeat. So I thought, no, this is an area where I can do unlock the potential a lot. So I started my career into schools capacity. I'm a, I was a principal also for two schools. Uh, down the line, 2010, I moved to the EdTech because one of my senior colleague as a mentor explored that I am into technology and I have a very different bent of mindset where I understand academic innovations and the need of technology today's world. So I started with my career with Tata Interactive as a Tata Class H uh, senior manager into academic delivery. That vertical just began two months. In six months, I was got a double promotions in terms of the kind of work I did into uh, business excellence strategy creating the roadmaps, what is required in the schools and higher educations today. Of course, it unfolded over time. Then I was heading a startup in Bangalore called Evo B Automations into LND again with the uh, academic innovations. But down the line, uh, I connect with Vandana a lot because at the age of 13, I have a very different thought of bent of mind and feeling the life and people around. I come from a spiritual bent of mind. I am born spiritual. I live a very fragile life because I lost my dad very early age. We are two ladies who run the house. So now it's me and my mom. So from 11th standard, I also started doing tuitions and part time after coming from school. I used to go and teach in a computer center. And I took my first LIC policy when I was in 11th standard. So journey is unfolding and making me learn a lot of stuffs that way. And with those cat got unrolled and I bought a house, that's how it is. But 2014 was a very important year of my life where I came across multiple youth and I felt that they need me because I used to provide them the solutions of the life problems, a conscious life decisions they need to take and many of them reached out. I have done around 5,000 adolescents, drugs, suicide, abuse cases till now. And then I thought, no. There is something which I need to do along with education. Education is not only about academics. As an academician, I'm adding value to schools, colleges, and edtech companies into the area I'm into strategies and business excellence. But besides that, the human touch is missing. Of course, internet is playing an important role. So I developed a product which is called Your Soul Soup. So I have a registered Eduvile uh, uh, LLP as my company. Uh, too young, I would say. Uh, under Eduvile LLP, I have done two projects, one from an edtech company which is a Texas based. Uh, my one project which I closed last year. Before that, I did one project from an edtech company which is in Germany. They are into assessments, Olympiads and course designing. Now I am uh, closing two more projects with God's grace. I am living in Bangalore, but right now I am in Gurgaon to close those projects. I hope that gets closed. And uh, that will be another part of my educational uh, thing. Though I am a solo edupreneur as of now, but in the journey I have earned people who are associated with me as an SME or freelancers, they work with me. But 2016, I was sitting in a CCD. I know that I, I am a conscious soul coach uh, where I have made changes in the life. I would like to make it mass. So I created a product which is called Your Soul Soup. Every soul has a soup, tonic. It is about, as uh, I loved, uh, what's his name? I'm sorry. Shubranj thought process, extrinsic and intrinsic. So my journey, I would say, last six years has been that. I learn what my soul teaches me. I don't learn from books. I have not learned from stars or moons. I don't know there is some calling from inside which tells me, I have not read any conscious books till now, but I got 
uh, an offer from someone to read a couple of books because that person told me 90% thought process you are crossed. It's that 10% 10 is the bottleneck. So I only learn from my soul and that what is I'm teaching. Because if I know myself well, as sir also, my glass is full, I would be able to deliver. So last four years since 2017, I'm associated with a couple of universities in Punjab because I hail from that zone, Delhi, NCR, Bangalore South. At various platforms from ministry to CII, I have been giving these thoughts. And I have a platform where I coach the youth on uh, your conscious. So my only two words are, we redirect the thought process. We have the preferences in life. We have choices in life. But sometimes we don't know whether those cho choices align with what is I am doing. So under your soul soup, we do that. And in, under Eduvale LLP, I take care of the EdTech projects. Uh, here I would like to say uh, two things because I would like to put forward to the forum here. Uh, what we are, why and how. Right now I'm in a stage where uh, I would like to get mentored with the right people, uh, Pansar, Ashok sir, uh, to understand that how can I scale up. And I'm very bad at sales and marketing. I'm very good at the pitch deck uh, with the content discussion every, but I'm very bad at so I tried to IM for a couple of uh, years last year. I'm 41 now and I've got my IM Calcutta now. So I will be doing that one year to learn. So being a learning a learner is very important. So I am looking forward for funding to investment to scale up my small projects and make it as a separate venture altogether. So where I can get help, sir, understanding, these are very, very important. But for most important is life taking life what means to you as a person and of course keeping the world around and working in with, along with the world. So that's what uh, is all about I have been doing so. Oh sorry. sorry. <laughs> ये लाइव जा रहा है उसके लिए है
yeah. He goes back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, I've seen it. Wonderful movie. Is it working? That's a wonderful movie. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. You're all entrepreneurs here. I'm not an entrepreneur. I do something different. And I just have one question to ask you. Do you think leadership aspect or leadership starts from a home? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me share a story with you. I uh, am basically a business intelligence professional. I've worked in corporates a lot. And uh, in 2007, I moved my family, my, uh, we were in a joint family and we moved to a nuclear family. We moved from Delhi to Pune and I had my small daughter who was going to start school. At that point of time, I joined a place and I put her in crash. And after that, she had an incident over there in the crash. Because of that, there was a psychological trauma she faced and wherever I used to go to my office, she would lunge onto my feet and she would not, and she would cry the whole time. As a mother, it was very hard. I had to consult a psychologist and they said that you, the family has to take care of her. Okay, I quit everything to take care of my child. But then I realized that if you, and I saw that everywhere because I have come from a place where my mother was treated very badly and I've seen my aunt being treated very badly and because of that I always ask this question why? Why is there so much of disrespect for mothers and wives who are known as homemakers? And that why led me to look for answers why does that happen? And that why has got me on answers and that is what I do right now. That is I take a new thought process forward. And I realize that we only accept work when it is done for money. We do not accept work when it is not done for money and that unpaid work is called a home. Because what we do like if my, I would have put a nanny or a maid to look after my child, it would be work. But if I do it myself, it's not work. How? Why? I don't even have a choice. How can a mother does not have a choice to bring up her own child? Why? Why is nobody asking this question? How can a maid be better than a mother? How does a maid have a better intent than a mother? You now we are all facing that there is a lack of value system. There is so much of corruption. Don't you think this absolutely starts from a home? And nobody wants to talk about it. I don't know. I have been trying to define a home for a long time because there is leadership aspects, there is emotional intelligence aspect, there is all aspects start from a home, nowhere else. But we have made a policy that we will accept only work when done for money. Then where is the possibility of making a home? How will I do my own work when I have to look out for a maid to do my work because the Qualification of work will happen only when it will be done for money. How will that happen? I don't know. I have been trying to get this thing across to people for a long time because this is where we are going wrong because a home does not exist. It has to exist for a business to exist. Even businesses require households. And household is made with people and it requires material and non-material aspect. A material aspect would be money. Somebody might be making money. Apart from that, there is the intent of a parent, love, kindness, 
compassion. All this is not paid. And I stand here because I am a business intelligence professional. Maybe I've kept aside that aside just to focus here because nobody else is doing that. But I stand with what I say that we require home fixes. And thank you. That's all I have. Live के लिए जो live हाँ माइक का जरूरत है। ओके सिया या बिल्कुल बिल्कुल। आई थिंक बिंदास बोल। ऑल राइट सो आई जस्ट कॉर्ड आई वाज जस्ट टोल्ड आई थिंक कपल ऑफ आस बैक दैट आई बी स्पीकिंग। सो व्हेन यू आर गिवन एन अपॉर्चुनिटी टू स्पीक ऑन एन एक्सटेंपोर बेसिस, द बेस्ट थिंग यू डू इन योर डिफेंस इज टेल पी and feel free to chime in your ideas. So what I'm going to do is I'll throw some proactive, uh, pro provocative ideas and feel free to chime in uh, and open, look into the future. So, and indeed, I mean, if you look at, if you look at some of the biggest companies in the world today, the IT companies, the consulting companies, they are investing and making businesses in something called the future of work, which Dolly Ma'am also thought, up, th thought about. So I'll, and part of that future of work is being able to crystal gauge and see what the future looks like, the future of work looks like. And I think that's particularly very relevant for all the folks who want to be educational entrepreneurs. So let's just, just do some crystal gauging and try and understand what are some of these trends that are disrupting the education space. Uh, how is this future of work overall, this whole model of future of work changing? And let's just see if that can throw some ideas and that can actually leave you with a few things to think about. So let me just start with the biggest trend that's the, that's changing. So this whole narrative around motivation of work, what motivates people to come to work today? Now, obviously, the if you look at Generation Z or the millennials, the 90s generation, whatever you might call them, so they are the generation who grew up in abundance. You know, they had abundance of knowledge, they had abundance of opportunities. Uh, you know, they, uh, careers were not straight jacketed as a doctor or an engineer. And the, if you look at the parenting, there's a term called helicopter parenting. So they've been brought up in a certain way. So the parents have actually stayed close at the, at the same time, given them, empowered them to do a lot of things. And because of that, you can call them spoiled. But for them, compensation is not the only thing. They are looking at flexibility in their jobs. They are looking at, uh, they're looking at a sense of purpose. So the new generation of worker it's interesting if you look at if you go back 200 back to uh, about 100 years back the richest people were really about networking communities even religion spirituality but today's generation who are really the brightest of the lot they seek validation they seek empowerment they seek connection with their work and that really is changing the whole purpose of work purpose why you want to come to office today and because this dichotomy where you have a situation in US where there's something called the great resignation happening. Thousands of people are quitting jobs, thousands of best minds in the business are quitting the jobs. And at the same time, you have another situation where people who are not as skilled are finding to get jobs. So the whole notion of what 
takes you to the office today is changing and that has enormous implications uh, for all of us as an education entrepreneurs. Uh, I think the other piece is really around what uh, what makes a good job. So I still remember and I've known uh, Vardhan Kabra. I don't know if you've heard or uh, known him. So he, uh, Vardhan Kabra was a, uh, was a IITN and an IM grad who about 15 years back quit his corporate job along with his wife and they were, they were, I mean of course he was very bright and he was doing very well in life. He actually quit his job and set up a school called Fountainhead in Surat. I don't know if you've heard of and his story has been captured beautifully in a book called, a book by Rashmi Bansal called Stay Hungry, Stay Foolish. Now obviously uh, foolish actually at that point in time about 15 years meant that you you uh, you know you're not really after money and you just kick that corporate life and get into something which is which is uncharted bit of an uncharted territory but that notion is now changing so if you look at uh, if you look at uh, the bain uh, the study that bain has done now they have identified they have created six different personas of people who go to work so i think they they've called them operators givers our own respected punser artisans, explorers, strivers and pioneers and what they are saying in their study and I'll keep it very brief but the most important piece they've said is that 25% of people, 25% of the brightest lot would be pioneers or risk takers in years to come which really means that you know their risk tolerance is among us, uh, a lot of people who are brightest are now keen to work on mission to change the world, solve problems like sustainability, work on things like circular economics and not just care, not just chase money all their lives. So those are the things that are changing and obviously that means as an education entrepreneur you'll have to kind of take a step back and think about what is it you want to talk about, what is it you want to teach to people. The other piece automation, we keep talking about this all the time, so automation is rehumanizing and dehumanizing the work itself, so obviously uh, you, automation has uh, changed the whole paradigm of how do you solve formulaic work, how do you solve pieces of work which are formulaic, which are repetitive. Uh, automation is also helping substitute jobs which were around problem solving, which were around connectivity, in, interpersonal skills and R.C. Sharma sir has did the session some time back. So automation is now also coming in and breaching the last frontier which is creativity so so you know you uh, you can actually have a ai or a machine learning algorithm to paint a beautiful picture for you and it's like a kaleidoscope so every time it paint it would paint actually a new picture it will every time it will come up with a new pattern and with quantum computing that power of thinking and imagining creativity could exponentially rise so some great things happening which really means that uh, you know, as a human being and uh, as a human being we probably would not have a lot to do and a lot to think about. So I think Pansar keeps say, saying that you know I want to design education for people who are retired. Uh, my worry is that you might have to well design people, who, education systems and edu what do you want to teach to people who are in their 30s, in their 40s and people like us because everything, the, if, if creative, <laughs> if things which are creative, if things which are subjective, if things that need human intelligence even if they can be substituted by machine. I mean, what would humans do? So we'll really have an age where um, human beings will just become obsolete or useless. So how do you teach people for that useless world? Of course, Sus keeps talking about it. So just wanted to reinforce that, that we are, uh, you know, at, on one hand, we'll have a situation where we don't have, uh, we don't have a lot of jobs for people. At the same time, we also have, we'll have also have a situation where we will not have people for the jobs. So. Uh, so education really has to be education for life and not for livelihood and of course you know you also have to think about how do you how do you help people uh, how do you use how do you as, as an educational entrepreneur help people reinvent themselves because that short that cycle of reinventing yourself will shorten all the time the other piece this is interesting and this is of this is more so post covid the world of work the world of workplace the definition of workplace itself is getting blurred so because of covid people are work after covid people are working out of homes i mean 60 there's been a 60 to 80 percent rise in people who are working out of homes so which really means the employee's relationship with his work and workplace is dramatically changing so you have situations where work from home is becoming more and more normalized you have something called a 
gig economy you have you have a term called digital nomads and you'll see you'll see linkedin profiles filled with people who are who are saying that you know we are traveling entrepreneur we travel and we do all the work from all over the world and we travel all the time so obviously that means that has a lot of implications the whole idea of work and workplace is now getting extremely fluid and that that is a big change and obviously that what that would mean what that would really mean is how do you at workplace build connect connection connectivity and most importantly trust now you've had a situation where there's been a lot of news around likes of infosys and i don't want to quote any company but likes of some big software companies firing people for moonlighting so all of those things will be a important paradigm uh, you know how do you actually build trust in companies in organizations where everything is now getting digital people are working more out of homes and then you have a situation of digital nomads of course at on first look it's a win when companies also save their real estate costs people can work out of their uh, people can work out of small cities like lucknow or saharanpur or whatever but at the same time how do you actually create that trust and all of that so quickly moving on the other trend and this is very important and this is something that we all should think about the younger generation this is very counterintuitive the younger generation is really overwhelmed they are suffering from what what, what they're calling cognitive overload and of course i talked about abundance i talked about people having uh, people having uh, people having things at their disposal but the flip side of that is that a lot of these young people uh, the generation z or people who are born after 90s and uh, the early uh, early millennials now get they are getting into the workforce and they suffer from enormous peer pressure fomo i'm sure all of you have heard uh, heard about so i think obviously we need to relabel that word and change that paradigm from fomo which is fear of missing out to actually jomo joy of missing out so what we have to think about as an entrepreneur how you can build a startup which actually transcends people from fomo to a jomo but but you know if you talk about if you talk about peer pressure if you talk about pressure if you talk about uh, mental health depression all of these things are real issues especially for people who are young because there is a lot of financial uh, the job insecurity the jobs are now getting more and more fluid there's a lot of financial insecurity so and i think the difficult part with that is that a lot of people who are in their 40s and 50s and i'm not uh, i don't want to get into controversy but the sad thing is that there is a disconnect and i think this is place where generation gap is actually most evident so you had this situation a couple of two minute, two minute. you had this situation a couple of uh, days back of when kapil dev the legend legendary cricketer made some comments on mental health and he was roasted life right and center on uh on twitter but the the difficulty is that the generation gap is real and for sure um i'll quickly talk about upward mobility because that's also important so if you look at the world uh how world has grown and how technology helped society leapfrogged in last 25 years so obviously i i a lot of there is a feeling that because of this new uh, ways of working we have actually reached the pinnacle or the summit of that climb so from here i mean the, the upward mobility that you know the baby boomers experience will the kind of uh, economic transition uh, transformation the world saw might not happen again so how do you think about that and how do you think about people from a uh, from a people and the generation perspective so i'll just uh, quickly summarize i think what this means from from a perspective of entrepreneurship and uh, educational entrepreneurship is that you know obviously you we have to prepare students for uh, being talent takers um, not not from uh, not from ta from talent takers actually to to shift to talent makers uh, the careers would not look uh, horizontal the uh, vertical the careers would look more and more lateral now so how do you prepare for those so those are the kinds of places where the long tail of opportunities and the ideas just are shared would be interesting uh the other piece uh, really is people spoke about leadership so leadership the whole definition of leadership needs to change so it's really should be around empowering and not managing people and then the other the last piece which i think is a big opportunity that a lot of us are not talking about is how do you build uh, how do you build a sense of belongingness um in the people who are now venturing into their jobs a sense of belongingness with their work with the larger society with their work because there's a lot of individualism 
So how do you bring that and that's where probably people spoke about spirituality but that's where probably spirituality might help as well. So sorry to just go over time but I thought this, some of these ideas might just help you think through and provide you some perspective on what the opportunities could be uh, in coming times. Thank you sir. Data Ram. This happened just a few after steam came. You had factories and you had work in factories. Prior to that, you all work for yourself, your family, your community. So things will change and we don't know what kind of social structure will emerge. But by and large, if you are positively oriented, it will all be very interesting. We will have the moon and we will have the Mars and we will have Jupiter and Saturn. And <laughs> That's a strategy. <laughs> I think when we started off with IBM, let me just come to a small story and then I'll take it on. You know, these, all these heading these big corporations, I don't know, they don't enamor me. This is almost about 13, 14 years ago, uh, part of the Pan IIT movement, I used to do a Pan IIT golf tournament. And at that point of time, HP converges and cognizant were being headed by IIT Kanpur people and one or two years senior to me or junior to me and I went to them here donation they do and at that time I think uh, cognizant or converges one of them the uh, brand leader was Tiger Woods and they said we have to do this I said what I will have to seek a sanction from the board 
because then you guys are only glorified clerks. That's what you are. If you can't write a check of even 50,000 rupees, then what are you? You are heading uh, these organizations in India and here in Gurgaon only. So that's a very sad, I think, uh, issue. And just before uh, today, we were lucky you come in at 9.30. And uh, Pansab and me, we were discussing this only issue. And Pansab came up with this idea that at one point of time, if you did IIT, IIM, and you got employed with an MNC, that was a dream job that you had got. But those guys who were selling credit cards, insurances, or doing investments for people. So is that entrepreneurship? Is that the dream that we are looking for? Fortunately or unfortunately, I was born in a business family. And in my second year of, uh, third year of college, I had taken a conscious decision that I not do a I not go I I got admission I am Ahmedabad and Calcutta, but by choice I did not go there because in those days the only job available after you did IIM and I, uh, Calcutta was you would work for a MNC or you would work for a large company. So when I did not do a job, why do I go to waste my time? So you know the choice of what you want to do in life should be very clear. And the earlier that uh, choice is made, I think the entrepreneurship path starts there. So my idea is that whenever a person wants to switch from a job to an entrepreneurship, which because we are talking about entrepreneurs, a lot of people, lot of people have shared their things here, to take that plunge. which I see with my peers who made a choice from uh, b being in a job to business, they keep postponing what Dolly G also mentioned because you have a comfortable salary that is coming home and can you take that risk? Can you take that jump? So that is where if you can do it early and I am so glad that there are two entrepreneurs who are here, one of course uh, Shubranch did talk about. There is another young entrepreneur, Parv, who has come all the way from Bareilly. He came last time also and he has come today also. So that is what is the choice that one has to make. Opportunity knocks for all of us. But can we grab that opportunity? Can we build on that opportunity? So one of the speakers earlier to me said this very good thing. Yes, we are driven by our passion. But does that passion satisfy your business idea? Can that be converted into a business idea? That is what is the question. So in my journey, uh, you know, I have seen many entrepreneurs come up who have challenged the old system. I have seen Dhirubhai come up from nothing. And I call him one of the greatest entrepreneurs of the 20th century. Because being only 6th class red, we have this notion that jitni padhai kar lenge, but I have met so many very successful entrepreneurs who are hardly read. They have gone to school for four classes or six classes or something. But they had one thing that was in common. The passion of their idea. The perseverance to see that that idea sees that they have flight. But the greatest thing that they had was that they could build a team. They could identify talent. <coughs> Who could deliver their idea? And I think Dhirubhai signifies that. But then Dhirubhai's record has been beaten by Adani. So, you know, what is it that I see? It is the drive to achieve. So, that is very important. And then I think in every opportunity, we must see, do the SWOT analysis. Our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunity and our threats. If we can do a SWOT analysis of that product or that situation we are in, then I think there is no end to what we can achieve. But one thing that I tell all my friends and I mentor a lot of startups and everything, 
the reason you got into entrepreneurship it's a one way street don't look back don't think that you can go back to a job or something so i have faced the situation myself in my life in my working life i put in now 50 years plus of a, a business life seen many kinds of businesses very very diverse and many of them were very earthy businesses with no technology involved and that was the challenge getting the work done from the lowest of skilled people because in msmes we do not get the best talent and in many times my employees were sometimes only 10th class pass or 12th class pass they not even go to college but i think that was a very valuable material that i got through whom i could achieve because they came with no baggage so this is what some ideas that i want to leave you with that once as an entrepreneur please do not think yourself there lot of uh, principals and teachers here in this uh, educational forum and one classic example is of course dr khan <coughs> be futuristic and have the belief system in yourself unless we have that belief system which is deep grained in our own self we cannot achieve in an entrepreneurship this thing and do not hesitate to take on mentors so i have had mentors who have been 96 years of old age i have had mentors who have 8 10 years i listen to them and i'll just narrate an example and then i think i'll stop at that i was building a house uh, redoing my house and since it was a brick structure my architect said that looking to the uh, non variability of the strength of the structure because that point, that point of time the structure was almost what 60 years old he says i don't know whether you can add more floors or it whether your foundations are there we had no foundation drawings should we continue with the brick structure so i had two choices one she said is we'll ex uh, externally build columns and uh, raise the upper floors on those columns i said that will kill the entire structural beauty of that house so she said second is that we can go in for a lsf design which is lightweight steel frame that technology has just come in and now today it is quite nascent so this was one of the first houses that was being built i was adding two more floors almost about i think 6000 or 7000 square feet of area so it was not a small construction that i was adding and i said okay let's go ahead so it had its challenges and then finally we came to the idea of flooring so i am a great believer in you know natural materials so i was thinking of buying marble and when i buy marble then i don't go to rajouri garden or something i go to the source because being a banya uh, i keep a cost factor which i think is very important for entrepreneurs keep your cost factor in mind so i was pre deciding to buy that marble and i had an architect who was having a standing almost 40 years of work uh, but at least we have that niche capability that is there and if we concentrate on the niche to start with i think that is where we can succeed because any business that we'll start will be in the msme sector and msme will be catering to some dish that is the idea i want to leave you with thank you so much thank you ashok for sharing your thoughts and for the wide experience you give to so what was the first time you showed me i think the essential session of this today is that educators try to become financially independent and financially autonomous the problem with the education system today is and i can say this quite boldly because uh, i have seen it at close quarters is that it is being run by people who dharm kehte hain from time the memorial ya hota raha wo karo and see the for example lots of nobel laureates so gp thompson got a nobel prize for proving that the electron is a particle His son Thompson got a Nobel Prize for proving that the electron is a wave, 
अब लोग कहते तुम कैसे आदमी हो तुम्हारे पिताजी को जिस चीज के लिए नोबेल प्राइज मिला उसी के खिलाफ तुमने वो करा कैसे हो कुपुत्र हो कपूत हो क्या हो क्या नहीं है मतलब जिस चीज के लिए तो ये नहीं है यू हैव टू बी एबल टू चैलेंज यू हैव टू बी एबल टू एंड परस्यू समथिंग विच इज इंटरेस्टिंग एंड इम्पोर्टेंट वाई आई एम अ सपोर्टर ऑफ एजुकेशन एंटरप्रीनरशिप इज दट एज लॉन्ग एज इट इज अथॉरिटी बेस्ड एजुकेशन you may say what you want it will be the education of the authorities they say na uh, ke jab tak history winner se likhi jayegi to winner apni history likhega wo uh, babar nama likhega akbar nama likhega wo likhega no state will promote an education which can even have the seeds of revolt against itself thoda bahut british education mein tha to wo sare yahi ho gaye so therefore only when there is educational entrepreneurship which means it is going to cater to what people need then you will have the real education isme koi bhi hoga matlab usme koi wo nahi hai thoda bahut dikhane ke liye kar le but nobody will work. and people don't want an educated population it is much more easy to subjugate an uneducated population than an educated ye baat chhod do go back to our mahabharat यक्ष प्रश्न में उसमें पूछा है व्हाट इज द पाथ वो कहता है जो ओरल ट्रेडिशन था वो लोग भूल जाते हैं एंड नो टू ऋषि अग्री विद दम सेल्स द ओनली थिंग इज टू फॉलो द पाथ महाजनो येन गता है सपनता सो द पॉइंट इज दैट वी डोंट वांट पीपल टू थिंक फॉर दम सेल्स बिकॉज यू कुड थिंक कम्प्लीटली डिफरेंट एंड वी हैव सीन इन साइंस एवरी फ्यू ईयर्स अ कम्प्लीटली न्यू चेंजिंग पैराडाइम स्टार्ट कमिंग वॉट यू थॉट इल ये is no longer true so my personal interest in educational entrepreneurship is this the education driven that way will truly be the democratization of education because it will be what the people want and more important what people are willing to pay for see the private education will survive on fulfilling their needs and they paying for it rather than government grant these that you and so no why should you do that and this is the reason why i am personally interested in educational entrepreneurship we can go on and on i wish this has stimulated something i'm very happy that some young people are there and uh, it will carry a momentum of its own and uh, thank you all for being here it's already very late so we should break for lunch as soon as we can you want to say a few closing words